Acts chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 9 to the conclusion of the chapter, verse 26. I'm going to give to you some information um, as we develop this, and we're going to move into uh, a portion that I've prepared. I actually, just to give you a heads up, um, my notes usually consist of around four pages. Today there's six, and so I'm just letting you know. So we got a lot of things to look at tonight. So let's begin reading at verse 9. Read to verse 11. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was, taking, uh, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And so let's begin with an introduction. Throughout the ministry of Jesus Christ, he prepared his disciples for his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so this kind of teaching was uh, very new to them. And it was difficult for them to grasp that Jesus, the Messiah, would actually die and be buried and, and be raised from the dead. That was a brand new concept to them. You see, their knowledge of the Old Testament was solid, but there were things that were still obscure to them that was especially true in the doctrine of the resurrection. They didn't yet understand that Jesus was going to die and be resurrected. Now, on various occasions, he told them that this would occur, but they had yet to really grasp his teaching. It says, for example, in Mark chapter 9, verses 31 and 32, that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. But they did not understand this saying, and they were afraid to ask him. So when Jesus was resurrected, he ministered to his men on various occasions. And that occurred over a period of 40 days. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 3, where Luke had said, To whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so when Jesus was resurrected, he ministered to them on various occasions over 40 days. Now, when you look at the gospel accounts, you're going to see that Jesus appeared to them various times. You'll see that he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, as it's rec uh, recorded in John 20, verse 16. He, he uh, appeared to other women, Matthew 28, verse 9 to two disciples going to Emmaus, Luke chapter 24. He uh, appeared to Peter, according to Luke chapter 24, verse 34. He appeared to the ten apostles, John 20, verses 19 through 25. He, he appeared to the apostles, including Thomas, in John 20, verses 26 through 29. He appeared to seven apostles by the shore of Galilee in John 21, to the men and perhaps 500 witnesses on a mountain in Galilee in Matthew 28, and to James, uh, Jesus' brother, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. So again, verse 3 tells us that when he appeared to them, he spoke to them of things pertaining to the kingdom. So he continued instructing them. He especially was commanding them to wait for the promise he said of the Father. And uh, we're going to be looking more closely at this promise when we get into chapter 2, because uh, the promise of the Father is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll be looking at that together in more detail. But as they were speaking to Jesus, they had asked him a question. They said to him, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It says that here in verse 6. Are you going to do that at this time? Are you going at this time to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I wanted to give you some things as I prepared to go into verses 9 and all. I wanted to give you some things that I didn't touch on last time. So you get a more full account of what is taking place here. And so they had an expectation concerning Messiah, an expectation that was common in the nation of Israel at that time. 
When you look at what is called the eschatological or the last times kind of calendar that the Jews had at that time, there were certain expectations that they had as it related to Messiah. They had taught that before Messiah came, there would be a terrible tribulation. For them, that would have been Rome. Before his coming, there would be a forerunner sent who was like Elijah. They recognized that as John the Baptist. After those two events, they believed that Messiah would appear and establish his kingdom. The unbelieving nations would ally to fight against Messiah. The nations opposing him would be destroyed for their opposition. Jer Jerusalem would be restored and, and be the city of the great king. That the Jews scattered throughout the earth would be regathered. That Israel would become the center of the world, all nations subject to Messiah. And after Messiah began to rule, that the world would enter into peace, prosperity, and joy. Now, as we've been going through and just concluded our study in the uh, Minor Prophets, we saw those expectations that were, that were laid out for the nation of Israel. And that's what they believed. And that's why they're asking Jesus, are you about to restore the kingdom to Israel? They want to know, is this the time that you're going to establish your earthly kingdom? Now, Jesus had said to them, this isn't your concern. What you're supposed to do is you're to go out and you're to preach the gospel. You see, the men still didn't realize that God was going to produce something that is called the church. As I've mentioned to you many times, when you study your Old Testament and you study your New Testament, you discover something interesting. You'll discover that in, in the Old Testament, the world of humanity, mankind, is divided into two sections, Jew and Gentile. And so when you go through the the Old Testament, and after the establishment of the nation of Israel and the covenantal relationship God has with that nation, you begin to see how that God will speak of them as the Jew and the Gentile. So humanity was divided into two sections, Jew and Gentile. In the New Testament, as Jesus was walking on the face of the earth, it was still regarded in that way, the Jew and the Gentile. You'll see sometimes in the teachings of Christ that, that he alludes to that when he says in Matthew 10, to not go to the Gentiles, but only to the house of Israel. Or when he's speaking to the Syrophoenician woman, and he says, I was sent only to the house of Israel. So you see that Jesus had continued ministering to the nation of Israel in his earthly ministry. But he also had something in store for the world that the world had yet to understand, and that was the church. And so when Jesus was speaking in Matthew 16 and uh, giving to uh, the disciples' instructions, he spoke to Peter and said, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And that's the first mention of the word church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. And so what Jesus was intending to do was to let them know that their ministry was prolonged. It wasn't something that was going to be over immediately, but there was an age that is referred to in, in theology as the church age, or the age of grace. There is an age that is going to be established where God is going to create out of the Jew and the Gentile what is referred to by Paul in his writings as the new man. The new man would refer to the fact that it's no longer the Jew, it's no longer the Gentile, it is also now the church. And the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles who come to faith in Jesus, the Messiah. They didn't understand this. This is something that was still at that point something that was foreign to them. It was what would be called a mystery. Now, the word mystery in the New Testament is used several times. In the way that we use the word mystery, we will speak concerning a novel that is a mystery novel or a movie that is a mystery. But the New Testament word mysterion, the New Testament word mystery, is a word that is really meaning something that at one time was hidden, but now has been revealed. So when the, mist, the word mystery is used, and it is used in the book of Ephesians, it will refer to, and does refer to, this mystery of the two becoming the one new man in, in what is called the church. In Ephesians 3, verse 6, it says this, this is the secret plan, or the mystery. The Gentiles have an equal share with the Jews in all the riches inherited by God's children. Both groups have believed the good news or the gospel, and both are part of the same body and enjoy together the promises, the promise of blessings through Christ Jesus. So Jesus' disciples did not understand yet that Jesus intended to create something called 
the church. They are asking a question. Are you about to uh, restore the kingdom to Israel? Because their eschatological understanding, their last days understanding, had been developed over time and they still embraced it. And so the fact is, no, there is something called a church age. And in order for people to be drawn into this kingdom that is going to be made up of Jew and Gentile who believe in Messiah, you're going to need power. You got a message. The message is called the gospel. But you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we saw in verse 8 when he said, you shall receive power after that the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And I want you to notice something. I don't know if I spend any time or much time at all pointing this out, but I'll point this out very briefly, and then we'll, we'll move into verses 9 following. But I want you to see again in verse 8 what he said, you shall be witnesses to me. A lot of times the church has made the mistake of thinking that our role is to, to uh, do witnessing. I think that, of course, it's important that we go out and, and we share the gospel. Of course, the church has been commissioned to go out. You see that, as I mentioned to you before, that we have what is called the Great Commission that was actually given five different times. A lot of times we look at the uh, Great Commission and we say, well, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and that's where you have it encapsulated. But each one of the gospels, Mark 16, Luke 24, John uh, 20, uh, and 21, there are, there are allusions to what they're to do, and Acts chapter 1 includes that. And so in Acts chapter 1, he was giving them this commission, but he was saying in the commission, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the power of the Holy Spirit, because you will never be successful in taking out this message without a transformed life. See, one of the things I was sharing with you last time, I'll touch this for just a moment and move on, is the church today can do a lot of a lot of witnessing, but what the church is supposed to be is a witness. Our lives that have been transformed by a message called the gospel is the evidence that God is in the life-changing business, if you will. If any man is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. A new creation. I remember hearing a a man, true story of a man who had, uh, when Billy Graham was a young man doing evangelism, he had given an invitation and this man had gone forward at the invitation. And so Billy Graham had ministers who did follow up. And so one of his ministers went to visit with this man and the man happened to be a very well known uh, mobster. He was, he was a very, very bad guy. He was a mobster. We used to call them mobsters. I don't know what they're called anymore, but a mobster. And so I, I don't want to generalize because I don't know that he was in the mafia, but that's the kind of mobster I'm talking about. So when the pastor goes to follow up with his very well-known gangster, mobster, whatever, lobster, when he goes to speak to him, he says to him, now that you've come to faith in Christ, your life is going to be transformed. And the guy says, yeah, I'm expecting that. Well, what are you going to do with your life now? Because he was a well-known uh, gangster and all. And he says, well, I'm going to continue what I do. And the, the, the minister says, what do you mean you're going to continue what you're going to do? Yeah, I'm going to stay in the lifestyle that I have. And he says to him, oh, no, that's really not a good idea to stay, you know, breaking people's arms and things like that. It's not a good thing to do unless you're UFC. No, that's not a good thing to do. Um, the guy says, why not? Well, because what you do is sinfully wrong. He says, I don't think so. He said, there are Christian truck drivers, Christian businessmen. I'm going to be a Christian mobster. True story. I'm going to be a Christian mobster. You know, see, the Bible teaches us that when Christ comes into our life, our life changes. That's why it's so it's sad today to see Christians who don't understand that arguing that it's okay to continue in sinful lives and we're still going to go to heaven. Why? Because of the grace of God. No, when you have actually come into 
into contact with the power of the Spirit. And when you've begun to read the Word of God and you begin to have a heart of obedience, you demonstrate that you've been saved by the life that you begin to live. You are not saved by your works, but your works demonstrate that you've been saved. And so Jesus said, you shall be witnesses to me. He didn't simply say to them, you're going to go out and do witnessing. He said, wherever you go, whatever you're doing, you will be a witness. That's why you are a witness on the job. That's why you are a witness at home. That's why you are a witness at the gas station. That's why you are simply a witness wherever it is that you are. And that's why it's important for us to remember that. Because it's not just going out with a Bible and telling people how they should live. It's living that Bible so people have a model of what it means to follow Christ. And that requires the power of the Holy Spirit who transforms lives to be, in, to be conformed into the image of Jesus himself. And so Jesus was speaking here and he's saying this is what's going to take place. You are going to be witnesses. And again, when we get into chapter 2, I'm going to spend some time looking, especially at the first 11 verses next time we're together. I'm going to share with you about this baptism of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, and how that works within our life. And so with all of that said, that's in a nutshell what we were looking at last time. And now as we pick up in verse 9, it says, When he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him, out of their sight. And so, as he's speaking, he actually is, is taken up. It, it, this speaks of what is called the ascension. Jesus is departing from earth, and he's returning to the presence of his Father. In, in Mark 16, verse 19, it says, uh, So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. In Luke 24, verses 50 and 51, it says, He led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. It came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried into heaven. Ask yourself what you would be thinking at that moment. I mean, think about it. I, I, I have to be honest with you. I've read this passage so many times over the years. But I've never really allowed myself to think about how that would feel to watch something like that. To see Jesus speaking and blessing, I mean, I don't even, I can't, I, I, I can't get, I don't get it. I really don't. I, to me, it's like, wow. I mean, are you kidding me? One, he was dead, now he's alive. He's been with me for 40 days and various times speaking to me. That's been hard enough to deal with. But to see him going up into heaven and be received by a cloud, that's an amazing thing. And so what we have is we have God the Father taking him up in his resurrection body, and he's now at the right hand of the Father. Again, that's referred to the exaltation of Jesus. And he is now seated, the Bible says, at the Father's right hand. Uh, the term at the right hand very often speaks of a place of power and authority. So when you see Jesus described in Scripture as being at the right hand of God or the right hand of the Father, what's that referring to? It is referring to the fact that he is there in a position of authority and he has power. In Romans 8, verse 34, the question is, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. In Hebrews 1 verse 3, it says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So this is speaking of Jesus being raised into heaven and he's now seated, exalted there at the right hand. In verse 9, it says a cloud received him out of their sight. Of course, this isn't an ordinary cloud. This would speak of the presence of God. In the Old Testament, it's referred to as the Shekinah glory. In, in, in Norwalk, it was called the Chicano glory. No, this is the Shekinah glory of God. And you see that in reference to that in 1 Kings, for example, chapter 8. In verses 10 through 12, 
where it says it happened that when the priest came from the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in this thick cloud. And so the picture that you have here is him uh, being uh, received up into heaven and the glory of God. Now, as this is taking place, verse 10, while they, they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So they're transfixed. Their, their feet are, are, are solidly planted on earth as they're watching in amazement as Jesus is received up in glory. And there's these two men in apparel. These two men in white apparel are, are obviously angels who are speaking to them. We know that on occasion in the uh, scripture, they will take the form of men. You see that in, in Mark 16, verse 5, where it says, They entered the tomb, and they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. This young man was actually an angel. So there are times that you'll see them taking upon themselves the form of a man, the appearance of a man. And so here they are. They're gazing transfixed towards heaven. They're in utter amazement. And the angels actually rebuke them, and they're telling them, what are you doing standing around? Didn't you hear what he said? You need to get busy. Now, again, maybe they thought that as Jesus went up, he was going to come straight back down. But it says here, no, you've got things to do. And as a matter of fact, notice what it says in verse 11. Why do you stand gazing into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, they remind them, and this is important, by the way, if you take notes, you might want to note this, and I'll, you'll see why in just a moment. The angels are rebuking them, telling them, get busy, and they're reminding them that Jesus will literally return to the earth. He's returning not in a secret or hidden manner. He's returning in an open manner on the clouds of heaven, as it says here. Now, why do I want you to think about this for a minute? There are false teachers that have said that Jesus will not literally return to planet Earth. I was reading something, an excerpt from a tract that says, you can live forever. That's the tract title. You can live forever. It was put out by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And it's found on page 147. The Watchtower is the mouthpiece for the Jehovah's Witnesses. And it says, Christ's return does not mean that he literally comes back to this earth. Rather, it means that he takes kingdom power towards this earth and turns his attention to it. He does not need to leave his heavenly throne and actually come down to earth to do this. As we have seen in the previous chapter, Bible evidence shows that in the year 1914, God's time arrived for Christ to return and begin ruling. It was then that the cry was heard in heaven, now have come to pass the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. The Watchtower organization all the way back in the early 1900s said that Jesus returned invisibly and that he was ruling in Brooklyn, New York in the Watchtower organization. Now that's why it's important to read your Bible. That's why, because they've been teaching this since 19, early 1900s. Of course, that specifically um, contradicts Jesus' teaching. Remember in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 62, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus said that. Revelation 1, verse 7, 
Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. There was no invisible or secret return. Every eye will see him. Scripture says it over and over again. And so I wanted to give you something because there are people who knock on your door and they will tell you that. And you need to be prepared for those kinds of things to be able to give an answer. Well, it says in verse 12, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. So they went about a half, uh, half of a mile and... Uh, that was the, the farthest that a faithful Jew could travel on the Sabbath. And verse 13, when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And so this, again, has given us an account of what is taking place. It simply says they returned to Jerusalem, and it says in verse 13, they entered into an upper room. So they enter into an upper room. This is more than likely the upper room where they had the Last Supper and where Jesus had ministered to his disciples. I want you to notice that there are 11 apostles remaining these are the ones who had been appointed by Jesus. Obviously, one of them is not there, and we know him by the name of Judas. And notice what they're doing in verse 14. They're continuing with one accord in prayer and supplication. So they remain in unity, they remain in prayer, and they're waiting for the promise that we'll see in chapter 2. So that's what believers are supposed to do. Believers are to remain united, to pray, and to trust the Lord to keep his promises. Now, it's interesting, there are others mentioned simply as the women. And so, seeing that they're unnamed, you have to supply who they could potentially have been simply by the women that are mentioned in, in Scripture that were normally with him. So, we know that, for example, Mary Magdalene was there, that Mary, the wife of Clopas, would be there, Mary and Martha, Salome, these are women that are mentioned as being part of the group of people that followed Jesus and ministered to him. And the number would also include Mary, the mother of Jesus. And that's what it says here. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. We're going to look at that for a minute. I told you I have a lot of scripture to give you today. Here's some more. Notice how scripture refers to Mary. And I want you to see that scripture refers to her in a fairly casual way. I want you to see that with me. I want you to see, and I'll read it to you again. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, why am I saying that? I want to spend a couple moments looking at Mary. The Bible never affords Mary any special recognition. Never affords Mary any priority of privilege. And the Bible never encourages inordinate interest in or even inordinate affection for her. In Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35, the Bible says Jesus' mother and brothers arrived standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who is my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. And he goes on to say this, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now it's interesting, brother, sister, mother, but he doesn't say my father. Brother, sister, mother, in other words, Anybody doing the will of God is part of my family. He's part of my family. She's part of my family. So the fact that Mary was his mother didn't gain her special uh, recognition or privilege in the church. There was no special treatment of her. But she is recognized as being blessed by God. 
we read in uh, Luke 11, 27 and 28, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. So there is no special recognition found in Scripture. She is recognized as the mother of Jesus, a tremendous example to all. But she also gave birth to her Savior, Jesus, her son. So she is not our co-redeemer. She is not our co-mediator. You see, when I was raised in the religious background I had, she was called the co uh, uh, co-mediatrix and co-redemptrix. See, I went to, to Mass in Latin, in the Latin Mass, and we were taught that. And so the Bible does not teach that, but that's what we were taught. What does the Bible teach concerning her? Well, the title Redeemer and Mediator, those are titles that belong to Jesus himself. According to 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus is my mediator, Jesus is my redeemer. And so I've had more than one conversation, and I know that for some who are devoutly Catholic that this could seem to be very offensive, and, and I understand why it would seem that way. No, I'm not bashing Catholics, but I am speaking concerning Mary. She's found here in Scripture. And thus we need to have a balanced understanding of who she is. She's the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. She's a person that we respect. She was blessed by God, an amazing woman and a great example of godliness. There's no doubt about it. But she's not my mediator. You see, my mom taught me as a little boy. Again, I was raised in the Catholic Church, baptized in small church in Los Angeles, had my first communion and my confirmation at uh, St. Pius X Church in Santa Fe Springs. You know, I was going through... Um, you know, the four, four of the sacraments, sacrament of, 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 of penance and all, I went through those things, and I, I had my, my upbringing in that religious belief. But also within that, I, I discovered that there were things that were added to what the Bible says, and, uh, and that's just a fact. I had, some, I had a friend of mine, his name is Bill. I still have him. He's still my friend. And uh, I meet with him monthly. He comes here monthly. I've known him since we were... Well, basically, we were in the same kindergarten class, so I've known him for a while. And so Bill uh, used to get angry at me and argue with me because he was starting to go to uh, Calvary Chapel, and, and he knew that I, as a Catholic, would not agree with what he was learning, and, and he and I would argue and all about you know, theology. He, he was going to Bible studies, and he would argue with me. So I try not to be offensive to those who hold fast to, to their Catholic upbringing because I'm not here to with the intent to insult people. But I do have a background and I do understand some of the things that people feel and all of that related to it. And so for me, Bill would say things to me and it would get me upset and all. So it caused me to wonder about, about what I had been taught. So I went to the, one of the parish priests there at uh, St. Pius X in Santa Fe Springs. I set up an appointment and I walked in and I sat down with uh, this particular priest and I was 20 years old, 19 years old at the time. And I said to him, listen, I have a friend of mine who is a Protestant. Now, that was supposed to get the priest mad, who is a Protestant. And he's arguing with me about Jesus, and he keeps telling me things about the Bible, and he's telling me I need to be born again. And I've been telling him that I'm a Catholic. I'm part of the first church that Peter is the first pope, and the things that we've been taught are the truth, but I need ammunition to deal with this guy. That's what, I was that's what I did. I wanted ammunition. I wasn't walking away from the Catholic Church. I did not walk into that priest's office with the intent of walking away from Catholicism. 
I walked into the priest's office because I wanted some ammunition to deal with this heretic named Bill. That's why I went in. That's a fact. I went in so I'd get some ammo so I could argue with him. And I'll never forget this. As I was there seated across from the priest, I said, this is what he's saying. How do I respond? He's saying I need to be born again. How do I respond? And the priest leans back in his chair and kind of like folds his arms. And he looks at me and he says, I've tried it all. I tried Eastern mysticism. And he starts telling me the different paths that he had taken. And he leans back and he says to me, and I came back to Catholicism and uh, it's no, this, that's no problem. And that was his answer. That was his answer. And so when he said that to me, now remember, I, I don't know how to contextualize this so you can understand what I'm trying to say. I was a hippie. I was a doper. I was an alcoholic. And I thought I was a Christian. And I wanted help. So I could rip up this Protestant, this Calvary Chapel Protestant. I was upset. Give me some ammo. And when he did that, and this is, I walked out of the office, I walked to my car, and it hit me. He doesn't have an answer. He doesn't have an answer. He can't give me answers. I was raised, like many of you, if I had you raise your hand, many of you were, were raised in the Catholic Church. Many of you were. The majority of my church was raised in the Catholic Church. You understand what I'm trying to say? It was like a light bulb began to go off in my head, and I said, he doesn't have an answer. He doesn't know how to deal with this. He's just telling me, relax, I'll be okay. And I'm not okay. I'm a doper. I'm a drunk. I'm messed up. I'm a lying thief. I'm a candidate for the pastorship. No, I am. <laughs> That's a fact. He doesn't, he doesn't have an answer. That's what made me more curious when I thought, maybe there is an answer to these questions. And the Lord used that. He used that in my life. And so when I came to faith in Christ, I have never come in with an attitude of disrespecting. I don't want to disrespect people. Some are very thin-skinned, and they're expecting to be. I'm not disrespecting. I'm trying to speak truth. In a, in a, I'm trying to encapsulate truth in a human form, if you will, trying to say this is how it has worked in my life as an example. So I came to faith in Christ. And I was, I was instructed from the beginning, God's word is truth. That was no problem for me because if God is God and he can create all things, I'm certain he can keep his word pure enough to communicate to me. If he can't, then what kind of God is there? He's weak. So the God that I know of in Scripture gave us his word. And so that's when I was seated looking at this big old family Bible that weighed like 200 pounds. And I was flipping it over, and I was looking for things in this. It was my sister-in-law's Catholic Bible, and I was just looking for the doctrines I had been taught. I didn't go there to argue with her. I wanted to tell her about the Lord. But she was in another room. There's a Bible. I've been taught to read it. I look at it. I open it up. It actually has from A to Z Catholic doctrine. So I think, well, I might as well educate myself. I'm a brand new Christian. I hadn't been a Christian more than two weeks, three weeks at the most. And I just start to look up, starting with the letter A. Well, the assumption of Mary. Is that, where does the Bible say that? And it doesn't. I kept going. And I, I looked up all these doctrines. Penance doesn't say it. Um, it doesn't say that she is co-mediatrix anywhere, co-redemptrix anywhere. It doesn't say she's the queen of heaven. And I keep looking and I start saying, well, if it doesn't say that, there's no, there's no place. Some of you may not have ever been taught the doctrine of limbo, where the souls of unbaptized children go in a perfect bliss but not heaven. So I look to see limbo. There's no such place. And, and I, the only place, I've mentioned this before, that purgatory, that was an interesting thing to me. And it said, purgatory does exist. It's junior high ministry. 
<laughs> but outside of that, and so, listen, the cry of those who were called the reformers was sola scriptura, the word of God only. That's what our faith is based on. And so the reason I'm even taking some time to look at Mary is just to remind you that the Bible is strangely silent about her. It does speak of her as being blessed amongst women. It does speak concerning her giving birth to Jesus, our Messiah. It does not ever refer to her as um, the mother of God, never does. So there are things you were taught perhaps that just don't find Revelation in Scripture. And so Mary was one who gave birth to our Messiah. So I have conversed with people on this before, and, and, and they think I don't, I don't respect her, and I do. I said, do you? And I've said, but do you? Oh, yes, I do. You respect her? Yes. Do you do what she says? Well, what do you mean? I said, all you need to do is look in the Gospel of John chapter 2. And Jesus is at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. And while he is there, his mother approaches him and says, they have no wine. Jesus responds to her and says, woman, what do I have to do with you? And in this conversation, Mary says something. She says, whatever he says, do it. Now, if you honor Mary, then honor her words. And her words are, Whatever he says, do it. What did he say? Believe in me. I'm the Savior. Follow me. Become fishers of men. See, that's one of the reasons that you can feel very confident to follow him. To follow him. Because even his mama said to do that. It's a, which is biblical. And so, yes, I do. I honor Mary's words. Mary said, whatever he says to you, do it. And so we have Mary mentioned here. We also have his brothers. I don't want to go into a long thing with you about that. I can do that too. I won't. But scripture records that Jesus had brothers and sisters who initially did not believe in him. Matthew 13, verses 55 and 56, the question is asked, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? John 7 verse 5 says, Even his own brothers did not believe in him. You see, what was taking place was, at that time, his family didn't come to faith, or was, did not have faith in him. After his resurrection is when they came to faith in him. Now moving on, verse 15. You can see now why I have six pages of notes. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120 and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now, this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. Falling headlong, he burst open in the middle. All his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that, so that field is called, in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. They proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. They prayed and said, O Lord, who know you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. They cast their lots. The lot fell on Matthias. He was numbered with the 11 apostles. 
So, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, verse 15. When you read your Bible, you see something about Peter that is charming and interesting at the same time. He had a very strong personality. Very strong personality. And he had tremendous influence. This was a man who was willing to speak out. And you see that as you go through Scripture. And you see this man as he's mentioned and the Scriptures that, that pertain to him. So in many ways, he was a very strong leader in what has been called the apostolic circle. When you begin to look at the lists of the apostles, you find lists found in Matthew chapter 10, in Mark chapter 3, in Luke chapter 6, as well as Acts here in chapter 1. His name is always first in the list of the apostles. You will see that every time the names are mentioned of the, the apostles, Peter is always the first name mentioned through the Gospels. And Judas Iscariot is always the last. And he's normally spoken of as the one who was a traitor or the one who betrayed Jesus Christ. When you go through the, uh, the Gospels and you look at this man by the name of Simon Peter, when you go through the Gospels, you see that this is a man who loved Jesus Christ and he's a man who had a tremendous faith. You know, it was Peter who walked on water to Jesus as it speaks of that in, in Matthew 14. It was Peter who confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, in Matthew 16. It was he who said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, in John chapter 6. It was Peter who said, we have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have, in Matthew 19. And it was he who said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. This is a man who is very strong and a man with tremendous faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was also Peter who failed to hold fast to his confession of courage. And it was Peter who, after he failed in such an open way, who was restored by Jesus in an open way. We remember how Jesus restored him and how that he commissioned him to, to feed and to tend the lambs and the sheep. And so in the life of Peter, his brokenness placed him in a place of leadership with a greater depth. Brokenness is what prepares you for deep ministry. You might want to mark that in your heart. If you want to be deep, I've said this to you so many times, you go through deep things. If you want to be a help to people, you're able to look back at the things you've gone through and you're able to say, this is where God met me in a special way. When I was at the end of myself is when I came to him. When I was at the end of my strength is when I found my strength is in him. When I was hopeless is when I discovered that he is my hope. When I had no peace, I discovered that it is he who is my peace. When I felt alone, I discovered that I'm never alone, for he's always with me and he never leaves me, nor does he forsake me. So those are things you learn when you're there at your kitchen table saying, I don't have two nickels to rub together. The bills are coming and I don't know what I'm going to do. And you say, but God, you have said that you would provide. Lord, help me. Give me wisdom. Direct me. Do something. Lord, sometimes I don't know what to do. And God has a way of coming through. There's one thing that I've discovered that is a benefit to just having a long walk with the Lord is things that at one time at the beginning of my walk with him thought, I will never see an answer to this. Those things have been answered. You see that in God's faithfulness. His timetable is different than yours. He works at a different pace. We're young. We run ahead of him. We say, come and catch up. And the Lord says, no, the shepherd walks and you follow his voice. I'm not supposed to follow yours. So you walk at my pace. You learn to walk according to my ways. You trust me, and I will never let you down. You will never be alone. You will never be without my presence. You need to simply trust me. Peter had to learn that. Peter was boasting, I love you more than these. Do you really? Do you really? Now, I say unto you that tonight you'll betray me three times. I'll die for you. These may, these guys I've always had second thoughts about but not me. I will never. Some in this room know exactly what I'm saying when I say 
I have prayed and said, I'll never let you down, only to wake up asking myself, how did I get here? How did I get here? What steps did I take to end up being the way that I am when I started out so well? Let him who thinks he stand take heed, Paul said, lest he should fall. Be aware that the enemy is there to trip you up. And as you're crying out to God, saying, God, I, I will follow you, that is, a, that is a prayer that God hears, and that is something that the enemy works overtime to undermine. Never forget that. Because as you are wanting to follow the Lord, there is one who wants to stop you from doing the same thing. That's how you grow in faith. Lord, increase our faith. The Lord says, it's not great faith you need, it's mustard seed faith. Just trust me, even a little bit, because it's not how big your faith is, it's how big your God is. And that's what we have to learn, you see. That's a bottom line, that's true. That's a bottom line. And so the Lord honors us trusting him. And now the apostle Peter is a man who really, really had a tremendous influence on the other apostles. But this is a man who failed, but Jesus restored him and his brokenness placed him in a place of leadership to a greater depth. So true to his character and true to his gifting, Peter has taken the role of leader. Now notice with me in verse 15, there are around 120 disciples that are, that are present at this time. And as this is taking place in verses 16 and 17, his knowledge of scripture is revealed to us because he begins to quote scripture here. Now, people thought that uh, because he didn't attend any of the appropriate schools, what we today call seminary, they would think that this man probably wouldn't know Scripture very well. Later on, when we get to chapter 4, you're going to see that because the Lord used him to perform a miracle on a, a crippled man. They were arrested for that, and they were uh, spoken, of by the, spoken to by the religious authorities. And after they were speaking to them, it says in Acts 4.13, they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated and untrained men. But the scripture said they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. You know, uneducated and untrained. One of the things that sometimes people will think that is, is that, well, I need, to, I need to go to these particular schools in order to be qualified, in order to be a pastor. And, uh, and I'm not one who says you shouldn't go to school, by the way. I think that school is extremely beneficial. And if the Lord places it on your heart and gives you opportunity to, and it's, it's the right thing for you, that is a good thing. Of course, training is a great thing. And we need trained theologians, absolutely. But also, I keep in mind that m majority of, of my friends who are pastoring churches that God is using uh, in the Calvary Ministries, they didn't go to seminary. They, they, they got into the word and they were, was, were with, with Jesus. They spent time praying and they spent time studying and, and God equipped them. He had gifted them. And because they have this tremendous love for Christ who is our savior, that provokes them to, to remain faithful to the Lord. What, what makes you faithful to God? What, what has made me, me as a pastor faithful to, to, to my wife, faithful for my children, faithful for my grandchildren? Is it because I'm, I'm faithful? Is it because if I got caught, I'd get killed by Marie? No, because if I'm deceitful enough to find a way to go out on her, I'm probably deceitful enough to be able to hide it from her. You know what it's been? Two things, I'll tell you. Fear of God. Fear of God. My God will reveal. And I'm aware of that. I have a healthy fear of God. See, an unbeliever, there is no fear of God in them, Romans tells us in chapter 3. There is no fear of God in them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise knowledge and instruction. 
No, it's the fear of the Lord that causes you to remain away from evil because the Lord will deal with those whom he loves and he will chasten. I'm aware of that. I'm very aware of that. And that fear of the Lord is also coupled with a love for the Lord. And a fear of the Lord and a love for the Lord has made me the faithful man to my family. It has made me the faithful man to my church. I learned a long time ago that no affair, no affair is worth losing everything for. No affair is. No relationship with somebody else is ever, ever, ever worth losing everything for. I'll give you one story, and then I'll move on and actually teach the Bible. But I'm trying to illustrate something here. I was a young man, probably in my late 30s or so. I had a dream that was so real. In my dream, I had committed adultery, and in my dream, I had to tell my wife. And in my dream, I remember telling Marie, I have been unfaithful. And I watched her eyes, and I saw the tears and the pain in this woman who came to faith in Christ because of me, through me, through my ministry. I watched her. In my dream, it was so real, the tears that began to pour down her. And then I had to go and speak to my children. And I said to my children, in my dream, your daddy has been unfaithful to your mother. And I watched my children's eyes as they were filled with tears and they lost that respect and honor that they used to have for me. I saw it. Then I had to speak to my friends in my dream. It's a long dream. I had to speak to my, my friends and I told my friends I have failed the Lord. And then I spoke to my church and I stood up and I spoke to the church. And as I said to the church, I saw that not only did I affect David Rosales and his walk with God, but I affected Marie Rosales. I affected four children. I affected friends. I affected a church. I affected a radio ministry that goes out on 40 different stations throughout this nation. I affected thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people. And that put the fear of God in me in a way that, that was fresh, that has remained all of these years. Nothing is worth violating your relationship with Jesus Christ for. Nothing. There's nothing out there that is more valuable than your walk with God and the influence that you have on other people for him. That is so important to me. And that came not because of seminary. That came because of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the desire to be honorable to him. And so as they were looking at this man, he knew scripture. As a matter of fact, he quotes two Psalms of David. The Psalms that he quotes are Psalm 69, verse 25, as well as Psalm 109, verse 8. And it gives to us some insight. And I'll give you one, one little thing here. I want you to see in verse 16 how it says, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David. That speaks of inspiration, the inspiration of scripture. Second Peter 121, prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. Men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So that speaks of the inspiration of Scripture as well as the person of the Spirit. Because notice with me, the person of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit spoke. Now it goes on, it had to be fulfilled, verse 16, which the Holy Spirit spoke before. Though Judas was the deceitful guide, yet God's word was fulfilled. His choice to betray Jesus fulfilled God's word concerning the death of Messiah. Now, sometimes people think of Judas and they say, my goodness, I feel sorry for him. We need to remember that he had incredible opportunities. According to verse 17, he was numbered with the apostles. He obtained a part of the ministry. Judas was outwardly a follower of Jesus Christ, but inwardly he never committed himself to the Lord. He was somebody that was so well trusted that he was put in charge of the ministry funds. As a matter of fact, when, when the Lord Jesus Christ was anointed and he said, this, 
this was wasted? Why was this costly um, perfume wasted? We could have sold it uh, for a great sum of money, 300 denarii. We could have given to the poor. Uh, he didn't say that because he cared for the poor. But John tells us he said that because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So Judas is a clear picture of a person who has had opportunity but hardens his heart. He's an example of what Jesus warned about in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember in Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23, where Jesus said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Judas is one of those. I never knew you. He had the greatest opportunity to know Jesus, but he never knew truly did. Think of all his opportunities. He traveled with Jesus, slept near Jesus, ate meals with Jesus. He saw miracles, even performed them himself. The kingdom, it has been said, was within arm's length, and still he refused to enter in. He had great opportunities, but no hunger for the kingdom, and instead he betrayed the Lord. Eternal life was there for him, but he chose the things of the world, and he chose spiritual death. He was one of the 12, but Jesus made it clear he was never truly saved. In John 17, 12, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so the scripture would be fulfilled. Now, what's it say in verse 18? This man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. The 30 pieces of silver that he sold Jesus for were used to purchase a potter's field. Now, the apparent contradiction, and I'm going to give to you something here. There's an apparent contradiction. Sometimes people who read their Bibles may, may say that because the Bible tells us that he went out and he hanged himself. But when you see in verse 18, this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So field is called in their own language, Akeldama, the field of blood. It's written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, let no one live in it, let another take his office. And so there are those who say, well, this seems like a contradiction because on the one hand, it says Judas went out and hanged himself. But on the other hand, it says uh, that he fell into a field. And the answer to that is, is actually uh, very simple. He went out and he hanged himself. The tree that he hanged himself on would have been over the ravine. He was hanging there. The rope eventually snaps. He falls down. He's rotted. He hits the ground and his entrails burst out. That's simple. I wouldn't want to be the one who found his body, but that's what happened. And so, we'll close with a couple of thoughts from verse 21 through 26 concluding. Um, when it says, uh, uh, of these men who have accompanied us, we need to choose some, someone to take his place. Once more, appealing to scripture, they decide his office is to be taken by another man. Now, there are requirements. They should have participated in, his, in Jesus' earthly ministry from John's baptism and they were to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection. Another earmark, by the way, of an apostle is that they authored scripture by the inspiration of the Spirit. Now, the question has been asked, are there modern-day apostles? There are those today, and you can see them sometimes on TV. They call themselves by the name Apostle. Are they apostles? Uh, not in the biblical sense. They may use that title for whatever reason they may have. But in the biblical sense, you know, it, it says it very clearly. They should be participating in Jesus' earthly ministry. They had uh, done so from the um, baptism of John. They were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. They also are those who wrote the scripture. So these men calling themselves apostles are not biblical apostles at all. For whatever reason, they've chosen to use that title for themselves. And so it says finally in verse 26, they cast their lots. The lot fell on Matthias. Now, the casting of lots was common in the Old Testament to determine the will of God. Proverbs 16, the lot is cast into the lap, 
but its every decision is from the Lord. Proverbs 18:18, 18, 18, casting the lot settles disputes and keeps strong opponents apart. So they would have a form of what is called casting lots to make a determination, and whatever the lot fell on is the person that they feel was being pointed out, and the lot fell on Matthias. The interesting thing, and I'll close with a couple thoughts. Matthias is mentioned here, and you don't see him anymore. It's interesting. You don't see him anymore. So there's a theological debate concerning Matthias. Did they, in using Old Testament procedures, remember the Holy Spirit had yet to fall on them and Pentecost hasn't occurred, did they use Old Testament procedures and actually go around the will of God rather than determining the will of God? And that's the argument that uh, theologians have. I'm not here prepared to give to you the answer for that because I don't know, but I will say this. Paul has been called the 13th apostle. But there are those who say that uh, it's very possible that Matthias was not the one who should have been selected. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. All I know is that the lot fell on Matthias. He fulfilled the number 12, which is the number of government. And we conclude the chapter by simply, where it simply says he was numbered with the 11 apostles. So he became the 12th with Paul. Later on, we'll see him becoming the 13th.